common dispute in psychology when discussing the origins of human behaviour is whether we are a product of nature or nurture. Regardless of where you side on this debate, there is one thing that is undeniable. Our environment plays a pivotal role in who we are and what we do. So in this instalment, we're going to take a look at how our environment shapes our behaviour. This is the final video I will be making before I start work on my new series, The Fundamentals of RBEs, where I will explain in detail what resource-based economies are and how they will work. Up until this point, my channel has comprised of analysis of the current socio-economic system and the philosophical justification of transitioning into an RBE. This is something I felt I needed to do in order to lay the foundations for the content I will produce going forward. By the end of this video, I feel that goal will be accomplished, and so now I feel that I can make more concrete videos with a lot more substance. With all that said, however, let's get back on topic. Human behaviour in psychology and sociology is often quite a controversial area, and it's not hard to see why. There is a plethora of conflicting theories about how we behave and why we behave in certain ways. I could make a 24 hour long video explaining every theory about human behaviour, although I'm not sure how time consuming that would be. No, today we're going to be instead focusing on the environmental factors and how they can change or be alleviated. It may be worthwhile watching some of my past content, since some of the topics discussed in my previous videos will also be relevant here. With that out of the way, let us begin. One of the environmental factors that shape our behaviour is the presence and degree of scarcity and abundance. I've discussed this briefly in one of my previous videos where I gave my opinion on the concept of human nature. In that video, I discussed the differences in behaviour between bonobos and chimpanzees in relation to what kind of habitats they lived in. Long story short, chimpanzees north of the Congo River inhabit a wasteland and share their habitats with gorillas. This means they live in a habitat of pronounced scarcity. Chimpanzee social structures are hierarchical and patriarchal. Social relations are often highly competitive, whether it's between individuals or groups of chimps. South of the Congo River, however, the near opposite holds true. Bonobos are a primate species that inhabit lands with dense jungle and foliage, where food is plentiful and there is little competition with other species for it. The result of this is bonobo societies that are more cooperative than their close chimp relatives. Social relations are mainly egalitarian and peaceful and when you look at how this relates to the environment bonobos live in, the fact that they live in natural abundance seems to have played a pivotal role in how the species' social structures have evolved. What we can draw from this is that societies that are competitive, hierarchical and warlike are likely to stem from environments of scarcity, and that environments of abundance are more likely to proliferate social structures that are cooperative, peaceful and egalitarian. Poverty whether abject or relative, is a state of scarcity of one's basic needs. We can define basic needs as the bottom two tiers of Maslow's hierarchy, our physiological needs and our safety needs, what we need to survive and what we need to function within society. When people do not have access to their most basic needs, or if those needs are difficult to attain, they are more likely to attempt to gain the things they need to survive by any means necessary. And by people, this can be anything from a homeless person stealing food from a store to nations where waging war with each other over vital resources. If the opposite were true, and everyone was guaranteed things like food, warmth and shelter, there would be less incentive for competition and conflict between people, because people would then no longer need to compete for resources or take them from others to ensure their survival. In the hypothetical scenario of people being provided their basic needs in some way or form, material scarcity would not be eliminated, but would be reduced to a level where people would have much less concern about their survival. Subsequent the assurance of people's basic needs is likely to significantly reduce civil and international unrest, which is a necessary part of transitioning into a peaceful and cooperative society. And this would all stem from the reduction of perceived environmental scarcity that comes with guaranteeing people's basic needs. TLDR, conflict between people arises from scarcity. So if you want to reduce conflict and unrest, reducing scarcities of things like people's basic needs is a good way to do that. Since the establishment of property rights during the Neolithic Revolution, humans have lived in environments of relative scarcity. This is reflected 
in past and present socio-economic models. Today, we live in a system called monetary market capitalism, a system characterised by private ownership of the means of production, the production and sale of goods for profit, and wage labour for income. While the birth of capitalism coincided with the start of the Industrial Revolution managed to raise production capacity significantly, the merits of the system don't go much further than that. Since capitalism is based on competition for private profit, and the means of production are privately owned, a certain set of outcomes and behaviours have arisen. Because the people who start businesses typically own them, most businesses today are hierarchically organised. Workers typically do not own the means of production they use, which means they have little control over their workplaces. They are subordinated by the owners of business, who in an autocratic manner dictate the conditions of work. Because of the hierarchical structure of enterprise, business leaders will often take advantage of their power, meaning they can and often do pursue their own self-interest with little repercussions. This can result in things like the repression of wages and the push for longer working hours, which in today's society both contribute to the issue of poverty. The desire to maximise profit is what gave birth to advertising. Businesses realised they could alter people's environment in order to convince them to buy into their product or service. Marketing creates demand for goods and has given rise to consumerism and consumer culture. Go into your town centre and you're likely to see some form of poster or a flashy billboard using manipulative imagery to try and get you to buy something you don't really need. Modern corporations are masters of manipulation. They know how to use marketing to significantly influence people's emotions, and this is what ultimately gets people to buy more and more stuff. Marketing has created an environment that encourages people to consume and consume without thinking about the impacts of doing so. There are many negative things that come out of consumerism, but that's a topic for another video. Although they may seem like two separate issues, consumerism and the hierarchical organisation of workplaces are in fact related. Because capital owners have the desire to make their assets as productive as possible, the owners of hierarchical business will often opt to give their workers longer hours. There is abundant evidence that suggests working long hours can have a negative impact on people's mental health. It can cause anxiety, depression and alienation, among many other problems. It wouldn't be a stretch to assume that marketeers would take advantage of this situation, however unethical doing so may be. Knowing how things like advertising can influence people's emotions, business Businesses no doubt use various marketing techniques in order to convince people that buying their product will make them happy. This socio-economic climate quickly creates a feedback loop where people become stressed out and depressed from work, so in pursuit of wanting to feel happy again, they go on shopping sprees in order to give themselves a dopamine hit and fall for the marketing promise that buying new gadgets or status symbols will somehow make them happy, if only for a short while. Consumers then realise they need to work longer and harder in order to afford these luxuries. So so they go to work the next day and the cycle continues. Something I didn't cover earlier in this video is how an environment where property norms prevail creates artificial scarcity. There are more cars in the world than people. We have an abundance of automobiles, yet no one can just go and access any car that's available in their vicinity. Why? Because they're likely owned by someone else. They are someone else's property. This means that while we have an abundance of automobiles, we have an artificial scarcity of access to them. This applies for many things, not just cars. There are also more mobile devices in the world than there are humans, yet people can only access smartphones if they own them. This artificial scarcity is part of what contributes to consumerism and hoarding, because when people perceive something as scarce, they tend to value it more, which means they want it more. The Industrial Revolution saw many people migrating from rural areas into towns and cities. The main purpose of this was the pursuit of better jobs and more opportunities. Since the 19th century, cities have modernised in design, however, they still cling on to a few archaic principles. The early planning of many of our cities was based around the automobile. It was at a time when cars were becoming more and more mainstream, and so it made sense to design cities in this way. Much of our urban planning is based around the grid system, with highways connecting distant points. This not only encourages urban sprawl due to open planning, 
planning, but also incentivizes more people to buy cars, which when you don't take into account electric vehicles, means more greenhouse gas emissions and more noise pollution. It's also not exactly good for people's health either, since more people using cars means less people getting active, which can lead to a number of health problems. Speaking of public health, it has been shown that exposure to nature can be highly beneficial to people's mental well-being. Unfortunately, nature and green spaces are things that are almost non-existent in many cities. Sure, you may have parks and small dedicated green spaces, but in modern urban areas, little of the natural world is to be seen, which means that many people aren't having regular interactions with nature, which has the consequence of people being alienated from it. And this could influence people's view of the world. Due to city dwellers' lack of connection with the world's ecology, people may become somewhat apathetic towards environmental issues. A similar thing could be the case with animal rights. Urban areas are mainly monocultural. By that I mean they are mostly populated by one species, humans. Whether I would consider modern cities fit for human habitation is a topic for another video. On the point I was making, however, yes, we may keep animals as pets, but they're not really an integral part of our city systems. As such, we don't really encounter that much wildlife often, which means people can feel alienated from issues such as animal welfare. It has also been published multiple times that urban living can have a negative impact on people's mental health. I assume that many people's lack of interaction with nature has something to do with this. Mental health disorders such as depression can lead to some self-destructive behaviours, including drug addiction, suicide, and alcoholism. Urban areas also have more violent crime. This is due to a number of things, including poverty and the mixing of poorer and wealthier neighbourhoods. Inequality is an effective catalyst for civil unrest. Just something to remember. The thing is, modern urban planning isn't concerned with things like human safety or sustainability. We live in a capitalist world after all, and so our towns and cities will be designed with one thing in mind, profit. It's profitable to design around the automobile because it helps out car manufacturers. It's profitable to have densely packed cities all viewing the same advertisements at once because it means more people are likely to buy products and carry on consuming. Modern cities are capitalistic to their core, but does it have to be this way? Do we have to live in a world of artificial scarcity, of unhealthy dwellings, of limited interaction with the natural world? Do we have to live in a world of poverty, inequality and ignorance? Do we have to live in a world of hyper-competition, where we all battle it all out in the great game of survival of the fittest? Where mass structural violence leads to mass behavioural violence, both of which cause suffering around the world? The simple answer is no, no we don't. So then, what are the alternatives? In a resource-based economy, we will use the best science and technology has to offer in order to optimise production for sustainability and access abundance, and in the process, guaranteeing all the world's people a high standard of living. We would foster sharing and cooperation between people by eliminating property norms, by encouraging collaboration, gift exchange, and open source tenure on intellectual assets. RBEs would create a healthier and more pro-social culture by integrating our living systems into the natural ecosystem ecosphere, including having vastly increased urban biodiversity and vast areas of green space that will allow everyone living within the city systems to have direct contact with the natural world. In a resource-based economy, we would design our population hubs with community in mind and not profit, money or markets. We could allow driverless electric automobiles, but would ideally optimise our city systems for walking, cycling and public transport. An RBE would be absent of money, which means there would be no barriers for people to access the things they need. Thus, there would be no poverty and little inequality. And as a result, structural and behavioural violence would be radically reduced. Our environment plays a big role in shaping our behaviour. So if we want to create a better world where people peacefully cooperate instead of aggressively compete for resources, then we must make radical changes to our physical, social, cultural and economic environment. Wrapping things up, today we have covered the different environmental factors that shape our behaviour, how our physical surroundings affect us, and how we can change our environment to create a more peaceful, cooperative and harmonious world. This is all from me today. Be sure to keep tuned in, as I have more videos coming up soon. If you like this video, give it a like. If you want to see more content from me, then subscribe to this channel. Sharing my content on social media helps raise awareness and helps the channel gain exposure. Also, when you subscribe, don't forget to click on the notification bell so you can see new content from me when it lands. For now though, 
Thank you very much for watching. I've been Adam Jones, this is me, signing off.